So hello, welcome to the UNCG Libraries Research and Application Series. Um, started around, I think like around three or four years ago. Um, and their series, their 30 minute webinars um, recorded in Zoom meetings where we're all now and very familiar with. Um, and they're about UNCG Libraries resources and research tools. Um, so they are recorded. You will get a link to this recording through YouTube um, because you signed up for this session. But um, it is also on our webinars um, web page that includes all of our webinar series as well as past recordings on things to do with research. So I just dropped that on the chat. So my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian and liaison to kinesiology, public health education, and community and therapeutic recreation. Um, and um, I will just be here to moderate so the way this works is that Anna will be presenting um, and on this choosing the right journal and getting published. Um, but I'll monitor the chat if you have any questions and stop her if it seems to be on that slide. Um, but if not, we will take we'll have time for some Q and A at the end where you're welcome to unmute yourself. But we do ask you to stay muted throughout the presentation um, if you can and uh, do it that way. So I see someone has their hand up. Uh, feel free to unmute and ask me a question in this logistic phase. Okay. Hello. I was just sorry. Do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, right. Sorry. No. Sorry. I'm on my phone. I'm I'm in my office, and there are two computers here that are not allowing me to log on. So I'm on my phone. So I just did that by accident. I've never zoomed. Oh, in it's on fine. My yeah. So I don't know how to mute my microphone or anything right now. So I'll, I'll mute it for you if you don't mind. And yeah, then that's uh, fine. You're welcome to participate in the chat or let me know if you need to be unmuted and. Um, so I just muted you and um, if anyone has any questions in the chat or they want to email me um, on the back end, I leave my email open during these. It's slharlow at uncg.edu, S-L-H-A-R-L-O-W at uncg.edu and I can help you on the back end while Anna is presenting. Um, but do remember that this is being recorded. So we will send you the recording after the fact as well for you to watch on your own. Um, and we add closed captioning and all that stuff after the fact. So without further ado, I want to give Anna time to present. Um, here we are with Anna Kraft, our UNCG Libraries Metadata um, Coordinator. I think I said that right. If not, you can correct me, Anna. Um, but she'll be talking today about choosing the right journal and getting published um, or quality journals. So welcome. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, everybody, for being here. So uh, the, as Sam has put in the chat, and as she said, there's a, a go link to the slides if you'd like to follow along and if you'd like to reference them afterward. Thanks for being here today on Health and Wellness Day. Uh, we weren't really thinking about that when we scheduled this, but um, uh, this, I guess, can be part of supporting your mental health is getting published. Um, so maybe there's a correlation there. So this is me. I'm the coordinator of metadata services here in the university libraries. And part of my work is doing um, scholarly communications, training and support for people on campus. So today we're focusing on selecting quality journals, but I do want to note that not all disciplines are publishing article based scholarship. So depending on where you are studying and working, you may be expected to write books or book chapters, to give conference presentations, to do musical works or choreography or visual or other types of artistic works. So there are lots and lots of different completely legitimate scholarly products that people are producing in a lot of different disciplines, but we're not focused on finding venues for all types of work today. We're really just focused on journals. So a question for y'all. Why do we publish? Feel free to um, share in the chat if you've got any thoughts about why we publish. Publish or perish. Yes sharing information, adding to disciplinary knowledge. Yes, all of these are great. So there are a lot of reasons that we might publish. Uh, the, the most sort of um, basic one is to share information and research results, contributing to knowledge for people everywhere. But also we may be expected to publish from uh, requirements from our jobs or from grant funders or others. 
We also sometimes are expected to publish to get a, a job or maybe to keep our jobs for reappointment, tenure, promotion. And if you're uh, a grad student who's looking to go out on the job market, publishing can help you there depending on your discipline. And then also getting credit for what we've learned and what we've done. So if I'm the first one to discover something in my research, I wanna be the one who publishes on it the first time. I don't want somebody else taking that credit. And there may be other reasons that pe people publish as well. And then, so where should I publish? Do y'all have thoughts on what might affect this decision? What sort of considerations go into this? When you're thinking about publishing. Yes, so the field of study, where you have funding, what journals are considered the best ones, whether or not it's a professional journal or some other kind of publication, these are all great things to think about. And peer review, yes, absolutely. So these are some of the considerations. And we're going to talk more about these, um, all of these, in just a moment. So I won't go through, I won't read everything on this slide right now. But I do want to note before we get into that, the considerations about the journals that you choose will likely be different at different stages of your career. And the little graphic on this slide is not meant to show the path that everybody is going to take. It's just kind of looking at some of those points along your career and some of the different types of works and articles that you might be producing, but it's not, not meant to say that this is what people are going to necessarily be following and doing. But considerations about where you choose to publish may be different for you as a graduate student versus later when you've got a tenure track job or once you've been tenured. And also there's no one best journal out there for all people to publish in. So different disciplines, different research and scholarship areas, and many other considerations can really affect the selection of what venue is best for your work. And while there's no one best journal, there are bad journals that you absolutely want to avoid. So these journals are often referred to as predatory, and they operate under unethical business practices. And sadly, publishing with them can actually be damaging to your career, especially if these journals are not peer reviewed and presenting themselves as peer reviewed. Having your scholarship in a journal like this can um, make your CV look bad and make that article look bad because there has been perhaps no quality control on it. So there are definitely journals that we want to avoid. And so these journals charge publication fees to authors, which is a practice in, with some legitimate journals. We'll talk about APCs in just a moment. But these journals do not provide peer review, editing, or other publishing services that legitimize content. And these predatory journals can be very aggressive, emailing authors directly, trying to solicit sub, uh, submissions of articles and other works and sometimes directly praising your works, making it sound like they really like your work and they really wanna work with you. And librarians can help you evaluate journals to see if they really are a place that you want to publish. So here's a quick example of a solicitation from a predatory journal. There are a lot of red flags here. The first one is the subject line, pleasure to have your article. No legitimate journal is ever going to contact you with a subject line like that. Another red flag for me is that I'm a librarian and this journal is called Applied Psychiatry. And I have no business <laughs> publishing on anything related to psychiatry. So this one went straight to my spam filter, which is good. Um, but sometimes I do look at these to see what sorts of things they uh, are saying to people when they try to sol uh, solicit wor uh, works. Um, but not all of them are using or showing such immediate glaring red flags. Some of them are getting much more clever, much more subtle, and it's really good to evaluate journals carefully before you submit your work, if they are unfamiliar to you, because it can be much harder to get your work back 
if it has already been sent to a predatory journal. I won't uh, go into detail on this, but there's a link on this slide if you'd like to see this graphic from SUNY Stony Brook that compares some practices and things to look for between predatory and legitimate publishing. And there's a really good site called thinkcheck-submit.org that will walk you through the process of evaluating journals. Um, and these are some of the considerations from their checklist. And we're not just focusing on predatory journals today, but I did want to share this information so y'all have this as a reference. But all of these are good things to think about when you are evaluating a journal to see whether or not it's predatory. And again, I really want to reiterate, it's great to check out journals beforehand. And if you have any questions, librarians can help. If you're not sure who your liaison librarian is, there's a link on the slide and in the slide notes that takes you to the page that will identify your liaison librarian based on your area of work. So now back to these considerations about where we publish. So this is the list that we had just a minute ago. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is open versus closed access. So the traditional model that's been around for many decades is this subscription based publishing model where individuals or institutions general li generally libraries are paying for access to content on behalf of their readers. So we as a library at UNCG are subscribing to a lot of different journals that people on campus and off campus who are UNCG affiliates can read online or sometimes in print. Um, so this has been around for a very long time. And if you've ever run into a paywall where a, an electronic system is asking you to pay 50, 70, $100 to access an article, that is a traditional or closed or subscription based model. So the content is not accessible to those who do not have subscription access or who have not chosen to pay. This model has been around a long time. It's recognized as a publishing model. It's understood and established as the model in many disciplines. But it's not always the best for getting your content out there and read. So open access, which I think many of y'all are already familiar with, is where your content is not behind that subscription or paywall. So your content is made fully available online to all readers with no access costs, no subscriptions, no sign in, nothing required of people who want to read it. And this model is newer. It's been around for a while, but it's much newer than that subscription or toll access model. And it's less understood in some areas or less established. So some people still have the mindset that this is where you just pay and you can get anything published without it being legitimate scholarship. And that's not true. So there are predatory journals that do want to publish whatever you will give them. Um, but legitimate open access is not like that. Open access can be completely compatible with all of the things that we associate with toll access scholarship. Copyright, you can re retain your copyright, peer review, generation of revenue for journals, prestige, quality, advancing your career, pretty much anything that you associate with traditional scholarship, except for that paywall piece. And what can this do for you? So there's a lot of literature out there, and this literature keeps growing in uh, the size of it, showing that articles that are made available through open access have higher citation counts and higher readership than those that are published through subscription or toll access. And this has been shown commonly enough that it has a name. It's called the open access citation advantage. And the calculation varies according to study. These are three different ones that are pretty recent between eight and 40%. So that's a pretty wide variation there for the percentage of uh, higher citations that you would expect based on having your article available, available openly. So it can really vary. Um, there may be disciplinary factors, there may be other factors. What has been shown though, is that there is an advantage. We can't really quantified exactly across all disciplines, 
but there is a citation advantage that you can expect to have if you publish your work openly. But really, this is something you have to decide for yourself if it is worth it to you. And going along with this is cost. So cost is sometimes something that keeps people from publishing their work open access. And so I said before, open access scholarship is free for readers to access, but it does still have costs associated with it. So there are still costs of the time of the people who are providing peer review and other journal services and those systems that go into publishing and producing that scholarship. So it's not free um, in the sense that there are no costs associated with it. It's just free for readers to access. And article processing charges are the way that many of these open access journals are funding themselves. So instead of having people subscribe or institutions subscribe, authors are paying APCs. So these are, it's a payment from the author or someone on their side of the equation of a processing fee to the publisher. It's very common in hybrid and fully open access journals. So a hybrid journal is one that's traditionally closed. Most of their content is available to subscribers only, but authors on a case by case basis can opt in to making their content open by paying an APC. So most content would be closed, some content is open. That's why it's hybrid. Fully open access journals have all of their content available openly. Many to perhaps most of them are funded through APCs, though there are fully open access journals that do not charge authors APCs. These APCs can be very expensive. They can be in the hundreds. Unfortunately, more commonly, they are in the thousands of dollars. The literature says that the average is about $2,100 to $2,700. I think what I see on average is about $3,000. So this is very expensive. This can really price people out of publishing openly in some cases but there can be help for this. Sometimes this can be paid through the author's funding agency or employer. And there is also funding through the library, which I'll talk very quickly about in just a moment. But first, publishers and journals should be completely transparent with you if, about if you are expected to pay. So look for this information before you submit your manuscript. And if the journal site is not clear about this information, then reach out to them. If they are not providing you clear information or they won't tell you this information, then you probably don't want to send your work to this journal. And at the libraries, we are really glad that we can offer credits for APCs and discounts on APCs with some publishers to people, uh, authors at UNCG. So these are the publishers that we're working with right now. Cambridge University Press, we have APC waivers with them that anyone on campus can use. SAGE, we have a 10% APC discount with them. IGI Global, we have some waivers with, with them as well. And MDPI, like SAGE, offers a 10% discount for UNCG authors. More details are available about all of these at the link below. And we also have an open access publishing fund. So we don't have deals with every publisher that is out there, but you still can apply for funding through our open access publishing fund to get up to $1,000 to offset the cost of your APC. And information about this fund is again linked on this slide. And here's a link to the online application form and our guide about the OA publishing fund. So please consider this as an option if you are looking for support with your APC. So moving on to other considerations, impact. There are a lot of ways to look at and think about journal impact. And I've got just a couple of tools and things to look at on this slide. We could do a whole presentation about this topic, but we don't have time for that today. So we're, we've just got a few things. So Simago JR is a free tool for exploring journal rankings and metrics. And Google Scholar Metrics is also free. I don't find it to be quite as useful as it's, well, they show you the top 100 publications, but that's like all publications from all disciplines. And it's not always very helpful to be comparing all disciplines together. So their search is more general. You can narrow it under categories, um, but it provides, I think, less detail than the Simago JR tool that is linked above. 
you've probably heard of impact factor. There is a proprietary calculation called journal impact factor. I believe this comes from Web of Science or, well, I think Clarivate Analytics is the one that, one that owns it right now. Um, so it's not something that we have access to as a whole in order to like go into their system and search for this, but some journals do share this information on their website. And then there are also maybe other journals that are calculating their own impact factor. So you would wanna be clear on what exact impact factor calculation a journal is sharing or claiming to share. Um, Yes, yes, Sam says that Scopus has their own journal impact factor too. So a lot of different sites and uh, tools provide things that they call impact factor, but there are, uh, <laughs> there are different ways that those may be calculated. And there are a lot of different journal level metrics and indicators out there. Um, some journals may have made up for themselves. Some may be recognized in the industry. So um, just be aware that what one journal is calling impact may be different than what another journal is calling impact. And researcher impact is also a piece of this. So there are a lot of tools that are out there that can help you understand and share the impact of your works. So we've done whole presentations on this topic too, but there are some good um, tools that are free for researchers. Uh, Google Scholar Citations, Scopus Author ID, and Web of Science Researcher ID are three of them that can help you track and visualize your researcher impact, like the impact of your articles, the number of citations, things like that. And I've got some slides linked at the bottom here that can uh, take you through a whole presentation on that. Librarians can also help you with this. And a note on impact, just because a journal has the highest impact or is considered the best one in your field doesn't necessarily mean that it's right for the particular work that you are working on um, or trying to submit right at that moment. There are other considerations that go into this. Peer review is something that was brought up a minute ago, and this is definitely a good consideration. So you want to be clear on what the peer review policy is of a journal. You want to make sure that they have peer review if you are trying to publish an academic article. There are an increasing number of non-academic and commercial venues out there that are contacting researchers, and this is actually different than predatory publishing. These are uh, companies that are clear about what they're doing, uh, but I think some researchers don't always read the fine print, perhaps. So, these are groups that are want to help you promote your scholarship to the public. So they may bring public readership to your work. Um, that's what they're set up to do. They want to get clicks, they want to get you out on social media, but it's not something that's going to help your academic career. And it, we have actually heard from several researchers at UNCG in the last couple of months who have been contacted by groups like this, who say, we wanna help you, you've got great research, we wanna help you publish something that will get people reading your articles. And maybe you do want to make inroads into more public venues to share your work, but if you're trying to get academic publications, this is not what you wanna be doing. Um, so again, if you have questions about the type of venue, contact your librarian, they can help you with this. Journal aims and scope is another thing that you wanna look at closely. So most journals publish within a niche under a broad discipline. They, most good journals are not publishing on everything in the world because you wanna be sure that your journal that you're working with has peer reviewers that are gonna be knowledgeable about your area um, and that they, it's not so broad that you can't be sure that they really actually know about your area. Um, and information about this should be easily accessible on the journal's website. It may be called different things, but you wanna look for like journal uh, information, aims and scope about the journal, something like that on the journal website and make sure that that aligns with your work and also that it makes sense. So I'll show you an example of one that perhaps does not make sense in a moment. Was there a question, Sam? Yeah, Anna, um, Maurice asked, how does the peer review vary between journals? What is acceptable? So, oops, 
Um, go back. Slides are not wanting to go back. Okay, but so peer review. Um, peer review, you just, well, you wanna make sure that A, it is peer reviewed. Um, and that you know that, okay, this is going to maybe be a blind peer review or a double blind peer review. Um, you probably aren't gonna get a lot of details beyond that. Um, I think the, big, the biggest consideration is just making sure that it is peer reviewed um, and that it's not one of these academic or predatory journals that well, is- and like, remember Anna when, we were, it was like a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago where we were getting all the stuff about um it wasn't peer review and they were like we're gonna get you out there faster yeah that was that piece that was really that academic and commercial venues yeah. um and when we looked at the fine print on that there wasn't anything about peer review it really wasn't academic so just because they are getting you published and get, bringing readers to your work does not necessarily mean that it's peer reviewed. So you wanna make sure that there is that peer review component. And did you um, see, so, uh, yeah, yeah, double, so double peer. blind. So a, a blind peer review is when you don't know your reviewers. A double blind peer review is when you don't know your reviewers and they also do not know you. So in some cases you may be asked to anonymize your work so that your name is not on it, so your institution is not referenced in it, so that if there are any identifying characteristics of your institution or um, anything like names of researchers, none of that or authors even would not be included. So you, when you submit your work, you may be asked to take all of that detail out. So instead of saying UNC Greensboro, say institution X, um, perhaps in brackets as, and it wouldn't be published that way, um, but it's just so that the reviewers do not know anything about uh, who the author is and what institution they're at. And that is to um, protect you and the reviewers from any kind of bias. So that's, um, I mean, in some cases, it, in some disciplines, I think it's not as common and some disciplines it, it is much more common, but it, it helps take that bias, potential bias out of the equation since they don't know you. So that's a great question, thank you. Um, so aims and scope, I took an example of aims and scope from the Annals of Glaciology. Um, this is a journal published through Cambridge, I think, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this tells you about what this journal is, what types of things they publish, um, that they, they do a lot of special and thematic issues and how, how that is handled. Um, so this is a journal that if you were working in the study of ice, you might want to publish with them if your work aligned with their areas. Here is a journal that I do not recommend anyone publish in. Um, so International Journal of Arts and Social Science. Sure, this sounds like a title, but also this sounds frighteningly broad. And when you look down, so this came from, I think an email solicitation that I got, International Journal of Arts and Social Science is an international journal which aims at meeting all needs of the diverse sections of people in the areas of humanities and social studies. That's really broad. There were some other red flags with this one. I'll show you some of them in just a moment. Um, but when you've got something that's this vague and this broad, people could be submitting pretty much anything to this. And I would be pretty concerned about that. Um, you also, so they say they are open access, peer reviewed, international journal, secured website, secured website. Um, so uh, don't also just believe anything that they say about themselves, read what their actual peer review policies are. This is not a good journal. Um, and I'll show you another example from, drawn from this one as well. Author guidelines is another piece to look at. So like the aims and scope, this information should be easily accessible on the journal's website. And sorry, y'all, we are a little bit over time, but I will try to move quickly through the next pieces of this. 
Um, so look for the submitting your article, instructions for authors, how to submit, or something like that on the journal website. And sometimes the journals accept different types of papers. So perhaps articles, position pieces, reviews. You want to make sure that your manuscript aligns with the content types the journal accepts. And some of them also provide information about formatting, perhaps numbers of pages or words that are acceptable. Make sure that your manuscript fits within those as well. Here's an author guidelines example from the Canadian entomologist. And this is just a little piece of their instructions for authors. So it was several, I, it took me a while to scroll through that whole page. So probably your author guidelines are gonna be pretty long and go into a lot of detail about exactly how they want things formatted, what's acceptable, what types of work they produce, um, and other things about that. So they provide a lot of detail in, this, uh, in these guidelines about the specific things that they will or will not publish in their journal. So again, not gonna read this whole thing, but this is the sort of thing that you would be looking for with the guidelines. Time to publication and time to acceptance can be another consideration. So generally you can find this on the journal's website and you may have a timeline as a researcher. Maybe you as a graduate student want to get something accepted or published by the time you're going out on the job market or you are tenure track and you want to have a certain article uh, accepted before uh, you go up for tenure so you can have that on your CV. Um, so you probably have considerations around your time with your publishing as well. You can look at the number of issues a journal publishes every year. If they only publish one issue per year, it usually means you're going to be waiting longer to get published. Um, and also look for calls for papers for special issues or special editions that may be focused in a certain area. We're seeing a lot of this with like COVID related topics and journals doing special issues relating to COVID. Um, so if something is a good fit for your particular work and it's one of these special issues, it may mean you actually have less competition for getting into that journal. And again, consider your own timeline and watch out for publication turnaround times that are not realistic. I'll show an example of that in just a second. So first, here's a time to acceptance example from some of the Springer Nature journals. And they have things broken down into submission to first editorial decision. This does not mean your acceptance. Um, and then submission to first post review decision. This is after you've been sent out for peer review. Again, you're not accepted yet. Um, so that first editorial decision is pretty quick with these journals, a week, maybe two weeks. The submission to first post review decision can be a month and a half, two months, maybe more. Average submission to acceptance date for all of these journals, well, there's one that's at 82 days, but that's the outlier for this uh, subset of journals. And then we've got some that are, the highest one is 260 days. So this isn't even publication, this is just acceptance. It can take a very long time with some journals. Um, so it's consider that when you are thinking about your particular timeline. But also do not send your work to a journal that advertises a timeline like this. So this is from a couple years ago. This is from that predatory journal that I showed a moment ago. They were soliciting papers to be sent in by July 20th they would accept or reject within five to six days and you would be published by July 30th. There is no time in here for you to receive any kind of meaningful peer review, layout, editing, anything like that. Um, so this is completely not realistic. There are some journals that will try to get, um, get you out for peer review and say like two or three weeks. But if you're getting some, uh, seeing something like this where it's like 10 days a week you're going to be published it just is not possible that that quality control is going to be there so walk away from a timeline like this indexing is another consideration so being indexed means that a journal has its contents or issues included in one or more bibliographic database or academic search system and we all 
uh, as researchers are often using indexes. Google Scholar is one. We're searching them on the library's website through ProQuest or EBSCO or something like that. So some databases index the full text of articles, meaning that their uh, searchers can get results on anything that's in the text. Others just index things like title, abstract, or references. So when people are searching, they're just getting results from those uh, those smaller sets of information on articles. But inclusion in these indexing databases makes journal contents more discoverable. So people can find them through library searches, people can find them through Google, um, depending on where they're indexed. And that helps raise the readership and use of the content. It's also a legitimizing factor. So being indexed, not, a, not all journals are indexed and often indexers these systems are reaching out and wanting to get content in there. They want to get good content into their indexes. Um, so a journal that's included in reputable indexes is likely to be of higher quality than one that is not. But there can be exceptions, especially with newer journals. So new journals just may not have had the time yet to be indexed. Um, some academic indexing services are very broad and provide content across disciplines. Others are discipline specific. Some are affiliated with institutions or specific publishers. PubMed is an example. They are maintained by the National Library of Medicine. Scopus is another. They're from um, Elsevier. And then just a few examples, just uh, some of them that are out there are on the bottom of this slide. Acceptance rate is another thing to consider. So the number of manuscripts accepted for publication compared to the total number of manuscripts submitted is the generally the acceptance rate. And most journals calculate this over one year, though some journals may be doing something slightly different. And a lower acceptance rate usually means that the journal is more prestigious, but it also means it's harder to get into. So maybe don't go for the journal with the lowest acceptance rate when you're first getting started with your first article. And rejection is something that's pretty common. So if you do submit your work and it is rejected, remember that it's not personal and it doesn't mean that your work is bad or that it's not publishable. Think of it as meaning something like not now or not yet, or maybe not this journal instead of this is not ever going to be published. Journals are looking for content to publish. So you want to make sure that your manuscript fits with what they are looking for, that you've got your formatting, you meet their guidelines. So do everything that you can on your end to make sure that you're a good fit. And that makes you much more likely to be uh, accepted by the journal that you have chosen. And just some quick thoughts before we wrap up on identifying potential specific journals. So this session is too short and too broad to go into specifics on individual journal or discipline needs, but these are some places you can get started with thinking about specific journals. Your advisors or mentors may have recommendations. Also think about the literature that you are reading and citing and where it is published. Your subject librarian may have recommendations. And then also the journals that what journals are cited by the literature that you are referencing. So sort of looking through that chain of citations and looking at where things are published. And again, if you need assistance with evaluating journal quality or with identifying journals, contact your librarian. We are here to help. Um, and that's what I've got for y'all. Sorry that this went a few minutes over. Um, and if you've got questions now or later, um, please get in touch. A couple people had to go and that's totally fine. I dropped information for them about the next session and they have your slides um, and the slides will come out with the recording. Um, but for y'all, um, and sorry, my boss is chatting me in the background. I just like was on email making sure everything was okay. Um, and I'm also on library chat. <laughs> um, so if you hear a ding, that's why, but I'll mute myself. But does anyone have any questions or concerns? Um, I mean, there's probably always concerns about where they published, but uh, questions, comments. Um, I also, as people are coming up with questions or thinking through questions, just want to say, I put it in the chat. Our next research and application webinar is on Dimensions AI, and they do have metrics in there. So if metrics and 
different ways of measuring impact is interesting to you, that could be a good session to go to. It's by our science librarian and health science librarian. Um, so I'm not sure what they're going to cover, but it will be interesting. And um, so check that out. It's on April 1st. Um, so you have another month to think about it. And then also all the links to the other ones coming up. There's another one coming up on legal research. So does anyone have any questions? I just had a question about um, the open access funding offered by UNCG. Sure. Um, so given that uh, financially, we all know UNCG is pretty strapped right now, um, is the budget for um, open access um, still there? Um, how does it work? Is it the tax year? Is it the academic year? Um, how easy is it to get funding for open access? Great questions. So it's academic year, the open access publishing fund, and um, we do still have money in that fund for this year. And we do expect that there will be funding for the next academic year as well. I can't put a specific number on it right now, um, but it's something that we've funded for a number of years. And there has been, there's a lot of support in the library and in the, from the Office of Research and Engagement um, to continue supporting this. So I feel positive uh, about saying that there will be funding in that fund next year. Um, and then if you're publishing with Cambridge, SAGE, IGI, or MDPI, there are waivers or credits, and you can also combine some of those. So if you're publishing with SAGE and you get the 10% APC discount that we want through the deal that we have with them, you could also apply to the OA Publishing Fund to get up to $1,000 to also go toward that APC. So you can combine some of these opportunities. Um, so with the OA Publishing Fund, if you're thinking about applying, I would say just apply as soon as you are able, as soon as you are ready. Um, we, we do still have money for this year, but if you're not ready to apply, um, then just apply when you're ready. And um, I, so far we have been able to, to continue to accept applications and fund applications. So that's, um, that's an area that's important to the library. Um, so just, just to follow up yeah. on that. Yeah. When you say ready, what do you mean by ready? Is it when you've sub finished the article and are submitting it, when it's been accepted, um, at what stage? Yes, great question. So the article should be accepted when it's been accepted for publication, that is when you should apply. And when you're, when you're submitting an article, do you, do you say to them, I want this open access at the point of submission, or is that something you negotiate afterwards? It really depends on the publisher. Some publishers, you're gonna get that question after your article has been accepted, when you're moving through that publication process, they'll say, you, um, do you wanna make this open access? If so, uh, here's what we would charge for that. Some publishers are all open and it would be at the beginning, you would be uh, agreeing to potentially a contract or well, it wouldn't be a contract until you're actually agreeing to be, you're accepted. But the understanding would be there at the beginning of the process that this would be open and there would be an APC associated with it if you are accepted. So the journal policies will vary. Um, and lastly, sorry. Um, it's fine. Oh, what was the other question about? Was it was all to do with open access? Um, at what point um, can you pull out of um, an agreement or a, a process with a with a journal? So, so maybe you've submitted it, and you think, yes, this is the journal that I want to publish in, and then suddenly something happens. You think, actually, no. I don't want to go ahead with this journal. At what point can you pull out? That's going to vary between journals as well. And it's not something that I have much experience with, but I think once you have signed that contract, so like what, when I'm thinking about my recent publications, my article was accepted and then it would go through layout and well it would it would have gone through peer review and then layout and and those kinds of steps and then when it is ready to be published once it's um 
been through all of the editing and everything, I would sign a contract. And at that point, that would be when, if I think, oh, I, I really don't want this, that I would, if maybe I didn't agree with something in the contract or something like that, that would be the point where I would say, um, or any time before that, that you could walk away. Okay, wow, I didn't think it would be that far down the line, actually, I thought it would might be sooner than that. Well, it, so it may depend with some publishers and you, we would want to be clear on what they say on their website and what they say in their process. But the, the contract is, um, in my experience, the point where you're saying, yes, go ahead or no, I'm out. Okay. And then just last question. Do you know of any other funds you can apply to, to get money for the open access? I'm, I'm wanting to publish an article or try and get an article published and very much have it open access to sub-Saharan Africa. So I really want it open access, um, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, so the, the ones that I talked about on campus are the only ones that I know of in that are available through UNCG, the OA Publishing Fund and the, the deals with those specific publishers. But there, it is possible that there are, I, I mean, sometimes we hear from people in various departments that there may be departmental funding, depending on uh, if you ask through your department. So that would be something worth checking on. And it's possible that there are other potential sources out there in academia. Some people write um, APC funding into research grants. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the ones that I mentioned are the only ones that I know of specifically through UNCG. There are the, I mean, and we don't know this. I'm not like, there, I'm being recorded, but um, I, you know, but you could also talk to, we, you know, the research offices. They have funds for like research presentation and travel. And I would assume that hasn't happened this year. So they could maybe flex that, you know? Um, so beyond, I, I definitely think what Anna said, you should talk to your department first. We have had examples with departments where, you know, the AP, we, they apply for the AP, the open access fund here. We give them a thousand dollars, but really it's a $3,000 APC. So the department will cover some, you know, research departments might cover some, they can kind of flex the spending, especially um, if you are co-writing it, also talk with your co-writers about if their university has any fundings too, right? Because you could split up the payment in that way. Um, so that's another idea that I've heard people do. Um, so, um, and like Anna said, I mean, right now, even with the budget issues UNCG is facing, they are very dedicated to um, open access and getting stuff out there in this way as much as possible for all the reasons Anna talked about. So, you know, I would ask around, ask your, ask your department, um, wherever your houseman is, um, fate, like, you know, like I work with a lot of HHS departments. So like you could ask them and if they're like, we don't have any money, you could ask above them, you know, just start asking around. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. And thanks for all your good questions. Oh, I've got a lot yeah, of questions. No, yeah, I, th I kept the recording on because I thought that would be useful for everyone, yeah. uh, but I'm going to stop the recording. Um.